Thank you, Susan. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Professor Manu Prakash today. Uh, it's just that this whole concept of frugal science just is, is just so close to my heart. And um, he's so he's the first uh, MacArthur Genius Fellow that we're hosting and a TED Fellow that we're hosting. So so no pressure on you, Manu. <laughs> he's a, he's an associate professor of bioengineering at Stanford, and he combines his passion for developing affordable and accessible technologies for education, research, and public health. Um, his focus is on resource poor settings with the goal of democratizing access to scientific tools. So the two inventions that he's famous for is the um, paper microscope called Foldoscope and the 20 cent uh, centrifuge, which is called the paperfuge. I'm sure this audience will love to hear about those two. Um, and his, his science innovations and inventions have applications everywhere from global health to environmental monitoring to biodiversity. And he's also doing some work on COVID. Uh, he works using an open source framework so that his innovations can be used everywhere across the world. So if this was a real um, seminar, then everybody would have clapped for him. But can we clap for him just to begin? <laughs> yes, thank you. I think people have muted their... Uh... Over to you, Manu. Thank you. Uh, and this is on behalf of me and Susan. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am delighted to be here. And uh, I think I would love for this to be more of a conversation. So please interrupt me anytime. Uh, I'll also make this a lot more informal uh, because this is just a close group of uh, people. And I think the thread that I would love to hear is share your ideas and thoughts because of course we have certain sets of things figured out when it comes to technology and access but we have a lot to figure out together, and especially the kind of uh, clinical input that many of you might have. Uh, I'll start off the bat. There is no real theme to this talk. I'm a scatterbrain. I think about many different problems, and I'm going to start by actually just sharing the source of most of the ideas that you'll hear about, uh, which is really curiosity. So ironically, you might say in applied science, when you're trying to solve problems, does curiosity have a role to play? And at least in my career and every single thing that I've done in my life, there has been this uh, moment, uh, kind of an aha moment when you're looking at something and you make a connection with a deep problem. So I think the way that I operate uh, as a lab is uh, we think about problems that we care about solving, but we also just think about uh, you know, what laws of physics allow us to do. And uh, at least what we believe the approach that we take in solving problems is this mixture between the two, which is what makes us unique in the sense of the types of solutions that we come off are not uh, off the shelf solutions. Uh, I'm gonna kind of mention one word about curiosity and then I wanna jump. Uh, this is something that if you want to play and what I really mean by curiosity, and if all of you have kids, you could do this at home, uh, find some food coloring uh, and put it on a glass slide uh, and I'm just going to play this video as a, you know, this is something that I worked on a couple of years ago, but I just want to show you a sense of, when I say a sense of wonder, what does that mean in the context of our everyday life? And let me play this video as a, not inside the, uh, you know, often enough, we think that we understand nature. Uh, this is literally just food coloring. And what is surprising, what you're watching is this really organic uh, activity and movement uh, inside food coloring. And, you know, we literally spent, uh, uh, I spent two years just trying to understand this problem for no value other than beauty. And I think I'll actually explain to you a little bit later that sometimes when you're thinking about ideas, uh, you park it in a portion of your brain and then suddenly something clicks that says, ah, the phenomena that I now so deeply understand from a very fundamental perspective actually has deep value uh, far beyond what you were imagining. Uh, I think it's kind of an inkling for, this is really my methodology of how we explore uh, uh, questions uh, that we want to solve. Uh, but majority of this talk will be in this framework, what I call frugal science. So let me just explain to you what I mean by this. 
what my interest in development and deployment of technology lie in this framework for as tool makers? How do we really think about as we share, uh, I mean, of course, first of all, do we share the class of tools that we build and share them more broadly? Uh, but a big question, which again, if you look at COVID, uh, it's been a singular aspect about COVID per se, is how science and society reacts in ways and what would be the role that everybody plays in defining the role of science uh, in our society. Uh, this is a picture that makes me both happy and sad at the same time. Happy because sometimes when you deploy technologies, you bring joy to people. When you deploy solutions, uh, there is a sense of joy. Uh, sad because we have a long way to go. Uh, anytime you're bringing solutions, uh, there is implementation science, which is as important as the invention. And although I am focused in this talk primarily on the invention side of the story, maybe in the very end, I will talk a little bit about the implementation side, which is really also uh, much of our work is going in that direction, is how do we partner with uh, people who have the same vision and a philosophical approach to this, but really focus on the implementation side of the story as well. These two things go hand in hand. Uh, so what do I really mean by frugal science? Uh, very quantitatively, you can think about, we deeply think about cost. And uh, every technology that we work on, we will try to describe it in a framework of cost versus performance. And once you really understand where performance comes from, and you really have a, a deep understanding of the technology you're working on, there are ways to bring technologies and re-engineer or completely rethink an approach to have a small hit in the performance, but a massive shift in the cost that it's accessible. Of course, there is a way to reduce costs just by volumes. That's one approach to it. But if you can fundamentally rethink the technology that you're trying to build, uh, you can think about this. And again, how do you do that in the early phase of development? So not once you've come up with solutions, but how do you do that from beginning? And I'll tell you in the full scope story, how we structured that. So uh, I don't have to belabor this fact, but you know the reality is that we just, uh, if you think about health, health is not accessible to everyone in any definition of health, health, health care that you might describe. Um, but one of the lessons that I learned along the way has been, uh, you know, the kind of nuances around why healthcare is not accessible to people. And many of you are even far more experts than I am in this framework. Uh, but the lesson that I have learned is uh, spending some time in specific communities and context really teaches us what the actual barriers of technology transfer and deployment of solutions looks like. You know, for my site that we work in Madagascar, we work quite a lot on malaria that I'll talk about. One of the one of the barriers is just distance and electricity. Literally, it takes 12 hours to walk from any road to our field site where we really do these malaria screens. And fundamentally, that distance is a, a key barrier in any sets of technologies that we're thinking about that would be feasible. Uh, the primary health centers are. Uh, uh, where you know the classic resources that you would think about in a secondary hospital are just absolutely not available. Uh, the other thing that I want to bring in, although the focus for this talk will be health, uh, I learned this the hard way, implementing solutions that education is an integral context to healthcare and healthcare delivery. Uh, and I think one of the factors, if you really look at the statistics of two billion kids defined by some sets of standards, uh, a billion might fall into places where schools look like this. I think the irony of this is that uh, eventually the, the students that we are training in schools are the ones that are going to become community health workers and the backbone of healthcare delivery. And sometimes uh, are we building and developing a kind of framework where you know, germ theory is not an abstract concept, but is a real reality of a, a, a fundamental understanding of medicine per se uh, from the very beginning. So I started working on education, starting to realize that if we don't build that pillar, it will be impossible for us to really have a, a much uh, broader impact. And then the last one that I just want to mention, and you'll see 
uh, our approaches in bringing diagnostic tools, not just to the uh, human health, but a planetary health perspective is the ecological degradation that follows uh, from our human activities. And I think this has been uh, almost an undercurrent that if you were to see it, uh, it would be obvious, but we choose to ignore a very large scale change that's been happening in our uh, you know, the, the ecology and uh, both urban and rural ecologies and how does that connect with the kinds of uh, healthcare challenges that we will face, but more so also for its own sake, uh, understanding and preserving the ecosystems. Uh, uh, and all of these challenges, and I think maybe the last one, um, of course, uh, there's things related to the pollution and uh, there is a big one that I don't know how to tackle, but I'll just say this, which is the public trust in science and the whole anti-science movement itself. You can quantify it many different ways. I think the educational approaches we take uh, have inklings and connections to this, but frankly, uh, this is something that bothers me a lot, but uh, it is something that we have to collectively also be thinking about. So uh, in the entire conversation that I wanna have today, I wanna paint this uh, kind of a marking line. This is really about haves and have nots. Uh, often enough, it is not about developed or developing countries, uh, but haves and have nots is an important framework that I want you all to think about. Uh, so. Let's kind of look at this. I, I presented a, a sort of a very bleak and a sad picture of our world in some ways because the challenges are indeed hard. And I think it would be, it would be unfair to not report it in the way it is currently. Uh, but on the bright side, as tool makers, uh, I often think about that when we are in our toughest uh, kinds of uh, challenges, uh, we are our best self sometimes. Uh, and the analogy that I want to give is the invention of bicycles. I don't know how many of you know this, but bicycles were invented uh, because of a giant volcano in 1815 that caused the largest famine recorded at that time in Europe. And that led to horses dying and people not having any means to commute until a bright person came up with this notion of a mechanized object to travel, and that was the bicycle. And the famine came back, the horses returned, uh, but the bicycle stayed on as an idea. And I think I've often taken the analogy to what's happening in the pandemic and the amount of innovation that has happened. Now we just have to make sure that many of these sets of ideas and principles that we've all been thinking about actually stay on beyond the pandemic. Uh, but the commonality in all of the problems that I describe is the fact that they are planetary problems that we have to be thinking about solutions that should be deployed across the planet and just thinking about in a local framework might allow you to tackle them locally, but uh, there will be uh, challenges if you don't think of it at a larger scale. And then the second thing, which is a little bit opinionated from my perspective, I often think about what we have missed out sometimes when we are deploying tools is a true conversation in an inclusive environment and a collaboration between amateurs and amateur scientists and professional scientists in an ecological context and community health workers and uh, healthcare workers that you would describe in secondary and tertiary hospitals, for example. So I think I want to be thinking about the users of the sets of, sets of tools that I'll talk about to be a very broad community. Um, so you might think that, um, have we ever had challenges like these before? And how do you really think about, have we truly deployed tools in the community? And I'm curious, uh, as a historic example, do any of you recognize what that object on the right side is? Uh, does that, uh, some of you uh, might immediately see it for what it is. Uh, it's a strange looking object, but it's a very important object for the history of humanity on this planet. Uh, and so Sputnik, you can, isn't it? exactly, this is Sputnik. Uh, and this object changed uh, human course in many ways in a massive influx of people starting to really think about technology and its role. But the interesting thing that is less known when Sputnik was launched was the fact that we had no technologies to understand or even track or prove that there was an artificial satellite in our orbit. 
anybody could claim that they have launched a satellite because space is a big place. Uh, and at that time, a very famous astronomer, Fred Whipple, came up with a beautiful idea. He thought, what if we really share the sets of tools and technologies for astronomy with the broadest group of people? And he started what is called Operation Moonwatch, which was the largest citizen science program in, uh, in, at that time. I mean, this is really at the heart of the definition of citizen science. And he shared tens of thousands of these telescopes with communities around the world, trained them how to look at the sky. And this became the backbone of for the next 30 years, much of the data that came out in astronomy from artificial satellite tracking was coming from community members. And many of the major discoveries of Sputnik 5, for example, was discovered by an amateur person. And this community ended up being uh, essentially the oldest running citizen science program. And I, I, I take value in this type of an experiment when I'm thinking about what do we need to be thinking about on the implementation science. Uh, and interestingly, I wanna draw parallels to public health and citizen science. I could argue that our community health workers might be the world's largest citizen science program at play. Many of the individuals that are engaged might not have the kinds of professional degrees. They might be, you know, have high school degrees. They are really proficient in the types of tasks that they do, but they're distributed. They're globally distributed. And often enough, the kinds of tools and technologies that I want to present, I am thinking about individuals who would be out in the field deploying these sets of tools or using these tools. And if you don't put them at the heart and center of tool design, you might miss on the fact that this is the kind of circumstances or the kinds of sets of individuals that we are designing for. So I want to state that this is really, for the many projects that we do, these are the sets of individuals that I'm excited about empowering. So on that note, this sort of sets the scale of what we will talk about. I want to jump in and talk about a few sets of technologies uh, if you have any comments, uh, you can sort of be sharing it on the chat side uh, and I could look through them uh, and anybody could kind of interrupt me at any time. But I want to now transition to share a few sets of technologies. I'll go very quickly to make sure that I can cover the breadth of things that we work on. And then I want to definitely leave lots of time for questions. Uh, so, and in that frontier of thinking about technologies, uh, of course, diagnostics is a big thing that we will discuss and talk about, but I also want, I'll include a mix of science education and environmental monitoring. Uh, so let's just first think about how do we, how do we explore these ideas? I, I started my lab almost a decade ago at Stanford around 2011. Uh, and one of the principles of this was to spend time with communities. And this is one of the biggest thing that I've been missing and most of the time, the origin of many ideas that I'll talk about were moments that happened in while trying to implement a certain idea in a community. And I very explicitly remember a personal moment for me in 2013 in Uganda, uh, talking to uh, a pathologist who had trained uh, students to you know, really do malaria diagnostics for 30 years. And he gave me a challenge that I still believe in. He said, you know, come back to me when you have invented ways of doing diagnostics under a tree. And I didn't really appreciate the power of that statement when he said it. I just you know, kept prodding, what do you really mean? And we had a very deep philosophical conversation really about access. And that really has shaped many of the ways that I think about and the kinds of technologies that I want to build should really work under a tree. That really makes this context of access uh, as general and as broad as possible. And of course, the context he's talking about under a tree is no electricity, no infrastructure, uh, and in a remote location anywhere in the world. Uh, so let me, uh, I'll, I'll do this very, very briefly because uh, kind of COVID definitely has impacted all of us. There is a large number of products that we have built and designed uh, for COVID response itself. Maybe I'll talk about one of them on the diagnostics in the very end, uh, but you know, the same sets of principles that we've been applying for technology development for a while, we also applied it uh, when COVID happened. Uh, there is a large number of projects that have come out of it that now are taking lives of its own. 
uh, all the way from an idea phase to a product in a very short period of time. Um, you know, on the very left here is an approach that we applied to asking a question of why do we really throw away N95 masks and this culture of disposable ways for protecting healthcare workers. And we explored, could we build robust uh, N95 equivalent masks that could be recyclable? And the purpose of that was associated with elastomeric respirators because of course they were not available when the shortage happened. And we had this realization that we could use snorkel masks and modify them in ways. So some of you who go diving might appreciate this. Uh, these are face masks that are used in underwater diving. And we were able to repurpose them, uh, demonstrate their efficacy clinically, and then literally get them through clinical emergency use uh, authorizations in two countries, in France and Belgium, and deploy 40,000 of them across the world. And that's equivalent to, and it's because they are used for many months, that's equivalent to roughly around four to five million N95 masks. I still get emails from the communities that we have deployed them, a very large connection of them in Nepal right now, uh, of uh, their daily use and the kinds of innovations that people have built on top of it. The Nepal team built a paper on this solution. So they even upped our game with the types of solutions we provide to add on to this. And this was all done in an open source framework in 22 countries or so with uh, communities around the world. Uh, another version of this is much more on the manufacturing. Maybe I'll bring it uh, in the very end. Uh, and then of course, uh, we also released an open source full feature ICU ventilator. Uh, let me, uh, much of this is actually published. All of this is on website, so it's easy to find, but maybe I just wanna bring up the context of just ventilators because I'm realizing uh, I will run out of time otherwise. Uh, uh, the perspective on ventilators for us was a very simple insights, which is the fact that you know, why is it that a critical care equipment is not accessible or available? You could say that, oh, the technology is quite complex. We looked at that and it turns out it's not, the technology is not complex uh, from the comparison to the, say a car, which is available, a motorcycle that is available around the world. Um, and one of the things that we realized is biomedical device design has a framework that you have to follow because it has to be safety oriented and do no harm oriented. That framework is not accessible to many innovators and communities uh, around the world. And what we decided to do is very much inspired by the example of how web browsers were developed. So all of you are watching this talk, you know, through some web browsers and web browser technologies. Uh, Web browsers uh, were scaled up by a reference open source design. And every web browser that you are using goes, its history goes back to an open source design. And of course, other players have added a lot of complexity to it, but at the heart of it is a blueprint. And we asked ourselves, could we apply this open source approach to a complex object like a ventilator? And that led to Pufferfish, which is now a, a open source ICU ventilator that you can see. It's a full feature ventilator on the left side. And the key goal on building the team that was associated with this was to ensure that we are building a solution that will be manufactured locally. We partnered with two manufacturers, one in Kenya and the other in India. Uh, we are in our clinical validation phase right now and if we succeed, uh, this would be the first ventilator to actually be manufactured on the African soil. And what is exciting about this type of an approach was, you know, of course, we've worked on a very specific product, uh, but what is more important is enabling, and it turns out the manufacturers in Kenya and uh, India are both car manufacturers. And this is the first time they have been able to transition. I mean, from a skill and a capability they are at par, but they've been able to build divisions focused around biomedical tools and technologies. And our hope is that that might be a much longer lasting uh, impact rather than just the product itself is really the framework that we have been able to provide uh, to build safe medical products. So 
this is all I want to say about COVID. Maybe in the very end, I'll talk about a COVID test. Uh, but uh, let me give you a few other examples for different types of products. And again, feel free to interrupt me anytime because I would love for this to be much more of a discussion. Uh, building on this framework of, and I am on purpose going really fast because uh, I want to cover a sprinkle of tools uh, and then really have 15 minutes for discussions. Uh, the perspective of uh, technology sometimes and you know, aha moments happening anywhere in the world and are dependent on interactions. Uh, this is an interaction that I remember with a community health worker that happened in Uganda for me. Uh, this was work associated with malaria diagnostics. Uh, and we, I was talking to him and he mentioned something anecdotally. Uh, I mean, there was a question that I had asked him, which is in their uh, healthcare clinic, I saw a centrifuge being kept on the floor being used as a doorstop. And you know, you, you see something like that and you say, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. Why do you have this $3,000 equipment being used as a doorstop? And then he reminded me that they used to have electricity at that station, but now for the last three years, they haven't had any electricity and the door keeps swinging all the time. And he found it as a useful thing because of course he can't use it because he doesn't anticipate any electricity coming back he was using that tool for its most appropriate function, which was a doorstop. And, uh, you know, I had thought about a lot of sample preparation, which is crucial in preparing samples, but I hadn't appreciated uh, that uh, the fact that if you don't have electricity, you're not going to be able to do a critical step. And on the flight coming back from Uganda, I started thinking about spinning toys. So I have lots of spinning toys at home. Uh, we first started working with yo-yos, which I don't know if some of you are familiar with. Uh, in the end, there are many problems uh, okay. with a yo-yo, but uh, this is actually a postdoc in the lab. Uh, he was happened to be a circus artist, so he taught me a lot about how to throw a yo-yo. But after a survey of all spinning toys, we actually stumbled upon okay. this object, which is called a button on a string. And uh, I'll actually just do a quick demo for this for all of you. So if some of you can see my screen, uh, I have this object in my hand. Uh, this is an object that we have now engineered that allows us to do nucleic acid extractions in the field. You can see these tiny little rubber places. This is where we inject the sample. Uh, I don't know if some of you have played with this toy. It's a very simple toy. All I'm seeing is a string and I'm just gonna spin it. And I don't know if you can hear the sound. And the quiz slash question for all of you is how fast do you think this thing was spinning? Uh, and if some of you have read the paper, clearly you're not allowed to answer, but I'm just curious, uh, you know, what comes to mind when you think about this? So 100 RPM. Uh, and so kind of because we don't have time, I'll just mention this. Uh, uh, we hold the world record right now of the fastest spinning object with human power. And this is around 125,000 RPM. And uh, what's very interesting about this is it breaks intuition. It breaks intuition because then suddenly I can literally pull out a single inflected red blood cell. So this would be equivalent of a centrifuge that can do 30,000 G forces. And historically, if you really look from the, you know, some of the anthropologists in this room, and since many of you think about human dimensions, this toy has existed for the last 5,000 or more years. It's possibly the oldest toy in human history. The Incas invented it, the Greeks invented it. It's been found in, uh, in Jerusalem, but nobody asked a very simple question of how does it actually work? And we ask that question. And then when you think about it, you can write down, this is how it works. Uh, and from that perspective, now you can go ahead to say, okay, I'm going to now take this and engineer into a solution, which is purposeful uh, for the purpose we want. And so this is the solution. With a single capillary blood in 90 seconds, we can purify plasma, for example, uh, within around 90 seconds. And uh, within a five minute period, we can spin down and we can literally pull out a single infected blood cell because 
uh, infected blood cell with falciparum, its density is lighter. And so of course, this is the Buffy coat assay that many of you have done before, but we can now do that completely without electricity. And of course, the joy of much of this is, uh, I'm gonna play this video kind of in this format. The joy of making tools in, is in sharing. And so this is actually the photograph on the other end of that picture that I had showed you uh, in Madagascar. Uh, this is a village chief in Madagascar that needs to sign up uh, if we are to be able to conduct a clinical study in the field. And behind him is the nurse. And one of the things in this interaction uh, that I find amusing and interesting is of course, uh, I'm talking in English that's being translated into French and that's being translated into Malagasy. And of course, I still can communicate with him because I understand his smile, uh, but also it demystifies technology. And I think this is something that I, as a public health tools, should that be an important, this is what I meant by education. The fact that there are all these, uh, ironically, you look at all the men in this room, there's only one single woman and she's sitting right behind the chief. She's the, the uh, community health worker. She's the only teacher as well in the community. And because of her stature, she's allowed in this room for decision-making. And I find this fascinating that from an early phase when you are thinking about building and designing technologies, you know, does it, does it show people that uh, they are empowered? And you know, rather than hiding technologies, kind of like Apple watches of the world, should we really make technology really visceral and intuitive in a sense? And should that be a design principle uh, for it to be adopted? That's another, one of the things that we did, we open sourced this tool and literally within a couple of months, hundreds of designs started popping in. And uh, there are three different diagnostic texts. Now there is a urine uh, bacteria test that's uh, group has been developing. We've been working quite a lot on uh, actually contaminants for lead contamination in turmeric uh, because there's a huge crisis in Bangladesh right now uh, where they're starting to find lead. Uh, so some of you who uh, look for, I mean, as a Indian who cooks with a lot of turmeric, uh, you might know it's an essential ingredient. And what was discovered was a significant portion of children were being exposed to lead primarily uh, because of the use of turmeric. Uh, and again, uh, this is what I sort of mean by a platform technology, because uh, once COVID hit, uh, we actually looked at this and we implemented a lamp assay based on a completely manual version of this, now we call Handyfuge, uh, that allows us to implement an entire COVID test uh, on a framework like this. And what this centrifugation step is doing is for saliva, it's doing the nucleic acid extraction step, which requires centrifugation. Um, so I'm gonna jump from, uh, and I'll come back to COVID test. I wanna jump from uh, uh, diagnostics to surveillance, because of course, all of you know from a context of a pandemic, what can we tell when we monitor uh, ecosystems? And I really apologize, I'm not really diving in into any of the detail and especially the clinical details and validations, because I just wanna give you a flavor of what we do and then really turn that into a discussion. So uh, let's talk about mosquitoes briefly. I know all of you, uh, some of us love mosquitoes, some of us hate mosquitoes. Uh, one of the challenge about this as an object is, I mean, of course, it's, uh, it's a deeply troubling uh, situation in the sense of the total number of diseases that mosquitoes uh, transmit. But often enough when I'm talking to communities and just uh, this idea, do we really understand their ecology? Uh, literally every year we are still discovering completely new species of mosquitoes still. There is 3,500 plus species. And if I was to give you a picture of one of them, could you actually tell me what species it was? Could you tell me whether uh, it uh, has a potential to carry human diseases even currently or maybe in the future? As new viruses come along, as we live along the interfaces of degraded ecosystems, many of them change. And we started asking ourselves and we ran into this beautiful puzzle, which I kind of call a mosquito bucket challenge as an analogy to the ice bucket challenge that happened uh, for ALS. 
Uh, this is literally the technology that we are currently using to do mosquito surveillance. This is not a made up picture. This is a photograph of a postdoc. Uh, sorry for the postdocs in this room. Uh, in Australia, literally using a forcep, and he has a bucket of 10 to 100,000 mosquitoes that were collected. And you can see a dissection microscope and he's going to be isolating and trying to identify species. This is clearly exactly what Ronald Ross did in India when he identified that mosquitoes carry malaria. And I think, of course, as a, as a tool maker, I was in Thailand and I got to witness hundreds of medical entomologists sitting in front of a microscope doing this day in and day out. And we started thinking about, is there a better solution? And literally the solution was in our pocket itself. We made a realization uh, that mosquitoes produce sound. So I'm going to see whether actually I might have removed, uh, no, I think I should have a picture or two. Uh, okay, yes. So uh, of course you have all heard that, uh, kind of a bothersome sound that a mosquito makes in your ear. And we made a realization, and this is published work, uh, that just using uh, the acoustic signature of a mosquito, uh, we can identify uh, what species it is. Literally using a phone uh, that is this, what is called a dumb phone, which you can buy for $5. There is around 5 billion of these. And what we've been building is an application on top of this, a web-based application that allows literally anybody to pull out their phone. If you see a mosquito, you identify a microphone on your, uh, on your phone and you record around one second of this acoustic buzz. And that is enough of a signature for us to do speciation. And we are starting to roll this out in the context of surveillance. There is a much broader set of a community that's starting to grow that's using this tool. Uh, and again, going back to unpredictable consequences when you share technologies with broader community. This is a picture that a collaborator of mine sent me from Madagascar when they started teaching and training kids to do this. It's a little bit loud, but I want you to see the excitement of these kids. I don't know if you understood what was going on where they were simulating the sounds of these buzzes. This was the training session. And after that, all of these kids went out into their community and actually built a mosquito map for their community. And we took those maps and we compared them with classical techniques. And we actually demonstrated that a few volunteers in a active kind of a format were able to essentially in a week build a better map of what the mosquito distribution looks like that we could make by these centralized traps. Because of course you can't put traps everywhere while people walking around when they notice a mosquito inside your house, you can just uh, collect one second clip and that's actually good enough for us to identify these mosquitoes. Uh, so now the other side of the challenge is, could you really do an approach like this to identify pathogens? I mean, I mentioned this that uh, you know, you don't just want to know what species there are. You also want to know in your backyard whether there is a new virus or whether this mosquito that's flying around in your neighborhood actually has dengue. So some of you who work on uh, uh, epidemiology know this, that it's really a numbers game. It's a very quantitative thing to think about. What is a percentage of mosquitoes, for example, that are infected? Most often you have to collect tens of thousands of mosquitoes to really get one or two positive mosquitoes. And we started asking ourselves, could we build a kind of a tool that allows us to bring diagnostics in a surveillance context in this perspective? That led to what we call vector chip. So what you're watching is a video of, we have fluorescently labeled mosquitoes. They are biting on an artificial substrate that we have created. And right there, do you see, every one of these little dots that I'm pointing to is a single mosquito bite. This is the saliva that the mosquito deposited. And what we do is we take these sets of organisms, we let them bite in lab and field conditions. And I'm just gonna skip to the punchline here. What we've been able to demonstrate in these types of frameworks is from that single mosquito bite, we can quantitatively tell what mosquito it is. 
because there is enough genomic DNA there to identify the mosquito without ever capturing it. And we can identify pathogens that you're looking for and quantify the total number of virus particles that were injected by that mosquito. And one of the big things that I'm trying to now do is to scale up this technology uh, to deploy in places and regions, especially looking for outbreaks of new viruses, and especially from a perspective of uh, starting to almost build like a, a, a fossil record system for a mosquito virus human interface. So what we can do with these little pieces of plastic is you can deploy them, you can let the mosquito bite and you can store it. But when a report happens that either a new virus or an old virus had emerged in a community, you go back and look in this fossil record to really understand the dynamics. So this is the other aspect of uh, interest here is can we build the kind of technologies to act as fossil records uh, of the changing uh, uh, context of exposure? So in the last maybe five minutes, I just wanna say a few words about microscopy and malaria and education. And I'm realizing it's already 1.44. Okay, so maybe I'll just spend five more minutes to just share certain sets of things that we're doing on the microscopy front. Uh, of course, microscopes are useful. Many of you use them in the field, uh, but ironically, they haven't changed that much. Uh, this is one of the pictures that inspired me to be thinking about microscopy from a public health perspective. I know many of you recognize this uh, very iconic man and for some of you who don't, uh, you know, it's, it, it really is a beautiful picture. I find so much irony in this photograph. You are watching a person who really revolutionized, uh, you know, thinking about uh, from a context of leprosy, for example, at that time, uh, a disease that uh, people were really stigmatizing uh, many of the folks with. Uh, but also you notice the sense of irony. He's using a technology that's possibly British made during the time of uh, you know, non-cooperation movements where he's wearing clothes that are handmade. And of course, uh, actually I've been looking at the history of this photograph. It's not clear whether uh, Gandhi is trying to identify whether he's himself infected with malaria. That's one story. And the other one, he's actually looking at leprosy samples. But what I took away when I visited Sevagram and I saw this photograph hanging was the fact that Literally, this is exactly the tool that we use right now. And so I'm going to now take you to Kalahandi, uh, which is an area in Orissa that we have been working with for a while. Uh, this is actually a pocket of malaria. Uh, and of course, it's a Nuxalite area that makes it very difficult to work in. And it's uh, some of those reasons the conflict and diseases go hand in hand. Uh, but literally, this is the life now of Durga and Prem. Uh, I have this time lapse. It's a one room hospital and you're watching Durga and Prem literally work for 10 hour uh, days where they will continuously spend time on microscopy for malaria diagnostics. The stains that they are using are literally a hundred years old. Uh, quite literally the GIMSA paper was published in 1904. And ironically, that is exactly the stain that we currently use. Uh, and when you think about this, they spend between 50 to 30 minutes per sample. There is not enough uh, minutes or hours in a day for them to really be able to provide diagnostics to community members that come. And you can literally see the line of people waiting for their results. And from time to time, somebody from the window will tap on Prem's shoulder to tell me, hey, do you have my result yet? Because I have to leave. And for most of you who have worked in community health centers, time is in a sense. A patient, you are very lucky to have a patient for 24 hours. I mean, it is impossible to convince them that, hey, I'll give you your result in 72 hours. Why don't you stay here in a, you know, in a hut nearby? That just doesn't work. So time is critical. And we started thinking about, of course, we'd been working on malaria for a while, is to automate this process in a manner uh, which was modular. So what you're looking at is a new tool that we've just released. We call it Octopi. It costs us roughly around $150 to build, but there are different heads. You can see the bottom are all the same, but it's modular. So on the very left is a head for malaria, but on the very right is a head for TB, for sputum samples. And 
building and designing a technology that's modular, that's configurable to the diseases that you care about uh, is important. But you can think about what do you want to be able to do with this? You know, literally, we can deploy them in large quantities. And this is just one quick demo for how this technology works. Uh, uh, here, Hong Chuan, who's one of the students in the lab, he's going to put a smear. You put the head on. And of course, this is not productized as yet. We're now working on an encased version for this. But after that, everything is automated. So the tool is trying to find what sample it is. It's trying to find where the focus is. At this point, this is a thin smear. And it will start scanning. It is all being run by a cell phone charger that many of you probably use when your cell phone batteries run out. Uh, and at this point, it's starting to do something very special, which is it's scanning this entire slide when a regular human does malaria microscopy, maximum that person can look at, say, 3,000 to 5,000 cells. The instrument is scanning and imaging roughly around 15 million cells in five minutes. And so you get the kind of perspective of what information is in this blood, and then using computational approaches, uh, which I'll just share in this video here, uh, we are actually able to identify every single cell. So I'll let this movie play. And it's quite a beautiful movie. Again, it's a little bit choppy. If you watch on the left, I'm actually scanning through all of those 15 million cells. And you can see this green dot on the top. This is literally with an objective that cost uh, $2, while at the bottom is data from an instrument that costs around 150 $150,000, and we are scanning through every single cell and computationally identifying. And one of the discoveries that we made here is uh, inspired from astronomy. So most challenging problem when you do malaria microscopy is the fact that you have to identify different types of cells. And you can see to the left are platelets, to the right are uh, malaria parasites. This is falciparum. But notice carefully the color difference. So what we are doing is not imaging, we're doing spectroscopy. Uh, what we discovered is because different cell types have different amount of DNA and RNA in it, we are building, uh, the dye is DAPI, but it provides a ratiometric or a spectral shift. So rather than identifying morphology by just identifying color, we can pick out a parasite. And because we can do that, we don't have to put a thousand dollar objective on it. Just with a two dollar objective, we can actually do this. And uh, this is sort of a work in progress, but we are starting to do clinical validation for this. And the kind of data that comes out of it are these scatter plots from microscopy, which is every single cell that's actually been imaged. Uh, and then the direction that I am excited about taking this is to really be thinking about just like what we did for Foldscope and other technologies. Uh, of course, I just shared with you data for malaria, but we have done the same thing, uh, starting to look at many different sets of diseases. And some of the latest data is not here. We've also been applying this for TB imaging as well. Uh, and the perspective here is how do we really empower a large group of people to really engage in bringing automated microscopy into healthcare. I mean, the tool making part is there, but what's missing has really been, is, is there a kind of a network that we can build? So I've been imagining for a while and talking to many partners across the world, uh, starting to create what I call this as an open diagnostic network, where it's the same instrument, people are using them for different sets of approaches, but there is a sense of openness in sharing data. And when you have an insight that you can share that with the broader community, so it can be implemented at a much larger scale. And then since I'm almost out of time because I wanna leave for discussion, let me just say two words about SnapDX and Foldscope. Uh, so going back to kind of, I believe one of the hardest challenge uh, is really around the context of education and how do we really galvanize communities to feel, you know, they're part of the solution. Uh, there is a sense of a broader engagement and people developing their own solutions on top of technologies that we provide. Uh, that was kind of our first experiment with Foldscope. Uh, some of you might have used a Foldscope. It's a paper microscope that you can build 
We've commercialized this technology so it's accessible for a dollar seventy-five to anybody in the world. Uh, again, the power of it lies in the way that we build and design optics. Uh, this is the type of data you can literally watch a single bacteria in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the way you use that is, of course, you can use it with your cell phones, but you don't need to. You can just watch things with your own eye or you can use it in a projector mode. Uh, but the innovation that we did in Foldscope was actually not in the tool itself. And it took me many years to actually realize and figure this out. When Jim and I invented this tool, uh, Jim was my first graduate student, uh, I put on a challenge to the lab. We said in our paper that it's going to cost roughly a dollar to make. And I asked myself, if that is true, can I deploy and distribute 50,000 of them? And everybody in the lab was a little bit shocked because of course we had never made even 10 of anything. How are we going to make and deploy and implement 50,000 of them? And this is really the essence of implementation science. But what was clear to me at that time is tools exist in a certain context. And I wanted to create a context where communities could take this project in their own direction. We posted that sentence on our website that anybody who wants a microscope, we will ship them. I got 75,000 emails. Uh, and we shipped around 50,000 of those. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars purely in shipping costs. Uh, but at that time, I didn't appreciate it. But now I realize what had happened is what we were doing, we're building a community. And of course, the tool is important, but the community has stayed on and is much, much more important. That community spans around 150 countries. At this point, we have deployed roughly around 1.5 million fold scopes. So this happens to be the world's largest microscopy community. And the number, the creativity associated with the kinds of projects that people do with this is just mind boggling. So if you go to this site, microcosmos.foldscope.com, people document the kinds of work that they do. There is roughly around 400 peer-reviewed articles in public health awareness, biodiversity mapping, education, diagnostics, agriculture. And it all started and sparked with the fact that we were trying to transfer the ownership of technology. And I'll give one example of this. This is a picture from Chhattisgarh. Of course, I'd been thinking about human health for a while, but I had never imagined thinking about working in agriculture a group in Chhattisgarh came up with the idea of training farmers to really identify plant pathogens. And they built an entire program that's built around uh, protecting crops. Similarly, there is an immense amount of work that has happened in veterinary science uh, associated with training local groups in taking care. I mean, sometimes when you think about, I don't know if some of you have heard this, uh, but animals are ATM. Uh, this is a common framework. And only if you've lived in a village would you understand what does that mean? Uh, what it means is an ATM, just like you can draw uh, capital immediately from your cattle uh, or from a machine, you can do the same thing if you take care and you have some animals. And taking care of the health of the animals sometimes is as important as taking care of health of your family. Uh, this is a very broad project, you know, with implementations. Of, this is a picture from Iraq. Uh, in conflict zone, thinking about education in conflict. Uh, of course, there is a perspective of uh, education. Uh, and then maybe I wanna leave with this one last picture. The exact same thing that we did with Foldscope, I'm now trying to do uh, for molecular biology. So what I'm holding in my hand is, I call this SnapDX. Uh, it's a type of a molecular test that we are trying to bring that's extremely modular, but at the heart of it, is extremely simple. It allows us to do just using hot water. And kind of the joke that I have is if you can make a cup of tea, you can really do an amplification based test anywhere in the world. Uh, we started developing this in the context of COVID, but we had been working on this idea for a very long while. The way this works is there is a chamber in which you drop your sample, whether it's saliva. And uh, I don't know if some of you can see my screen, this looks like a syringe where you move this plunger from left to right. And what that does is it moves a DNA capture matrix from one to the second to the third chamber. But inside this object, it actually stores all the reagents 
that are needed to actually run the reactions. And effectively, the way you read this out is, uh, so here is an example of a clinical uh, data for COVID. I don't know if some of you can identify what's positive. So look at the color change from the first picture. The, so out of the sets that you have, you'll see this deep yellow, that's a positive test. And the first and the fourth are positive and the rest are negative. One of the big things that we are trying to do with a test like this is to really be thinking about a minimal test uh, that allows us to really broadly bring molecular testing, but which is tetherless. So if you have a cup of coffee or a cup that you can use hot water, you can actually run this entire isothermal reaction with it. So that's all I want to say. I'm already realizing that I broke my promise of saving 15 minutes for discussions. I actually do have time. So if this link doesn't disappear and if some of you have time, I would love to have much more of a conversation, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Lovely. Can we give him a big round of applause, please? Mm -hmm. I can't see people. <laughs> oh, wow. Speechless. <laughs> uh, there is a question here from Abhinav. Can it filter among multiple, I think he's referring to, your, to that intervention, innovation, multiple mosquitoes that could be, yeah could be flying around at once. Yeah, so I think the way that we do this is uh, there are roughly around tens of thousands of wells. So we use the Poisson statistics. The probability that two mosquitoes will bite the same well is very, very low. And then because we are looking for a molecular marker for a specific mosquito, you can identify. And the nothing that can probe can actually leave any DNA. So we basically made a skin mimic and that's what took the longest. So the mechanics of it works that only a mosquito proboscis can actually mm -hmm. penetrate. And then we discovered something accidental, uh, which is very exciting. By tuning the stiffness of these membranes that protect our chambers, we were able to exclusively make a mechanical filter for a specific species. Okay. So say, for example, if you deploy this chip, only Aedes aegypti is actually able to penetrate mechanically, and hence you are only sampling a subpopulation in a mosquitoes. So, so Manu, uh, may I follow up on that? So hi, my name is Abhinav Sharma. Really a fantastic talk. I'm a uh, cardiologist here uh, at McGill University. Uh, I spent a little bit of time at Stanford doing my advanced heart failure training um, and I attended several talks. I, I, I've heard of one of your talks before as well down there. So it was great to, to see you again in this context. Um, so uh, one, one question that I had is, uh, I, it looks like a lot of your work sort of centers around the intersection of, of, of um, infectious disease and, and, and population level uh, care. But we know that in a lot of the same places that you're working, um, Chronic diseases, you know, such as uh, diabetes, atherosclerosis, is, is is contributing now to a tremendous burden of adverse outcomes. Mm -hmm. One of the things you know we're seeing here in, in Canada is it, simple things like like uh, measuring glucose, you know, measuring markers of inflammation or atherosclerotic risk is, is it can be cumbersome for patients. You know, it takes a while for the test to come back. They have to get the blood draws. Are you are you intersecting, or is any of your work intersecting in that field as well with regards to? Uh, rapid bedside sort of diagnostics mm -hmm. for, for diabetes and atherosclerotic disease? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I want to just say two things. Uh, uh, one is this factor of, of course, the, the breadth of problems is what keeps me up at night often enough. Uh, I've been trying to share the philosophy of how we design solutions much more broadly, because of course, we are a small group of, you know, five, 10 people. Uh, and there is a finite amount of things that we do. But uh, very recently with Madhu and a couple other people, I taught a class on frugal science with innovators from around the world. I think we had 170 students. And to really broaden this perspective that we should really put cost at the heart of design. So that's one. But uh, very interestingly, uh, I mean, we were deploying some of our uh, imaging solutions in Rwanda. And then in one of the uh, situations, a doctor pulled me to the side and he said, uh, you know, this is fantastic, but I really want to bring this to cancer care. We, he, he said he, they have the largest number of head and neck cancer patients that show up anywhere on the African continent. And of course, they don't understand why that is specifically, uh, but eventually one of the challenges uh, that's important to be thinking about is 
when we are developing platform technologies, they have uses far beyond what we can imagine. So for example, uh, this test that we have been developing, of course we can do COVID with this, but we made sure that it can handle uh, saliva, sputum, urine, and blood all in the same framework. And then tons of other people can say, oh, wait a second, I'm just gonna change the cartridge inside it and I will look for something completely different. I will look for say glucose in, in another context. And so it, it's important. This is also why we, what we need, and again, from a business perspective, it's very important uh, that uh, you know technologies and its core can be modular, but solutions are packaged in a manner that hide capabilities. And we don't have real ways. I mean, if I was to give a business pitch to somebody, they would tell me, hey, focus your technology on one thing that has the biggest market and that's it. And sometimes that is useful for that specific market, but it's not broad enough and it doesn't bring more people into the solution. So it's a very difficult challenge. And I think my hope is that more and more people take that approach. That's great, thank you very much. I have a question. So how do you try to, um, like, how does this whole open source work when you develop all these different innovations slash inventions? Um, who sponsors, you know, the scale up? Because it's it's always a challenge. We have quite a few innovators in our division and they're struggling as academic entrepreneurs because the university doesn't support open access and mm -hmm. open access is like a loaded gun. The investors <laughs> are out of the room the moment you talk open science or open access. So how do you make it sustainable even though a lot of well-intentioned individuals like we have in our division too, we have so many innovations that are like just dying to be rolled out to the planet, but, mm -hmm. but the funders have this clause that, you know, it should be da da da. How do you do that? How do you navigate that? Yeah. I mean, I don't have any solutions on that. Literally uh, I've been trying to raise funds for SnapDX, for example, and uh, it's a huge challenge. I would, I would put it in two bins. I think of, of course, open access and open source. And uh, there is a spectrum all the way from uh, one spectrum is that the technology is completely unaffordable. Now that's a really bad place to sit in. What is the point of a therapy that's going to cost a million dollar per patient, right? Yeah. And then on the other hand is you can think of it as a spectrum that as long as you can anchor and build sustainable solutions mm -hmm. that are affordable and you can still have a competitive advantage and really, so for example, I mean, with Foldscope, we designed two or three versions of Foldscope and one Foldscope is available for $1.75, but there is another Foldscope that is packaged differently and has some bells and whistles that actually cost $25. And that supports us entirely. I mean, when we ship a $1.75 Foldscope, that is at a zero margin and the entire operation of a five people team deploying a million Foldscope is completely supported by individuals. And we make that publicly clear that if you support this product, you are supporting deployment. And there are ways to think about it, but I, I think I agree with you uh, that I think investors and entities, they sometimes they don't understand because markets are very complex. And I've been thinking about much of the work that we do in a framework of how do you enable others to build solutions on top of what we have done, because we will never be able to a, do everything, and B, uh, really think from a bottom-up approach to even identify some of those solutions. So it's a, it's a complex landscape. And I think you know, my hope is, as philanthropists often think about just dumping money sometimes, or, uh, I mean, there's so much money in global health, frankly, but whether it makes a sustainable long-term impact is depending on, can we really find partners uh, that, uh, you know, if one set of a solution decides to go in one direction, there are other sets of people that can fill that gap. So it's, it's not trivial. And I think there's a lot of innovation needed in implementation science, mm -hmm. but it is where we are that this crossroads, if we don't do this, uh, then markets will not solve these problems. And I think universities, the most common pitch that I give to university administrators is, look, this is, this is exactly what we were put together for. 
is to really step in where markets have failed because innovation happens everywhere. And uh, we have to really do something where, uh, and we can actually take that kind of risk. It's perfectly okay. I mean, I run a lab. It's perfectly okay if something fails completely uh, because that doesn't have the kind of impact that it has on uh, people uh, that are doing this without a safety net. So, I mean, ironically, this is exactly what we should be doing, but it does require all of us pushing together. Mm. And of course, educating the people who have the funds and who want to make an impact, because clearly there are many impact investors that are out there, but they don't understand that the scale of this can be so large. Uh, I mean, there's 2 billion kids on this planet. And I often think about, I mean, we've reached a million kids so far, but there is a long, long way for us to go. Thank you. Susan, over to you. I am just um, in awe of all of <laughs> you and of the, the, just the generous spirit that you bring to all of this and how much good you've been able to accomplish. Yeah, I think it's, it's a long road. I often think about the, the generosity that people shared with me in being able to do this. So, and I think my hope really is that um, many of you think about ways of engaging as well. I would love to sort of see those directions because, uh, you know, yeah, clearly we can't do this alone. It's a very inspiring presentation. Absolutely, no doubt about that. Teresa has a question. How do you see this technology being integrated into health systems? And I don't know which technology she's talking about, probably the yeah with, um, with the malaria I think test that I can I can make a general comment around the malaria side of the story. Uh, and one of the things uh, I literally had last night a conversation with Africa CDC uh, partners, just trying to understand because the both the context and the logistics of uh, even larger scale field validations is quite complex that sometimes we ourselves alone cannot uh, do that. And then context is very important because people have to build trust with new technologies. I've been in plenty of conversations with WHO where many people don't even understand fundamentally the the positives and the negatives of microscopy, but because they read some report by some strategic consultant and then they said, oh, microscopy is never going to be able to do this. And suddenly that becomes just a mantra along. So I think part of this is actually education. Mm -hmm. Part of it is real. I am a big believer in implementation at small scales to truly demonstrate the power. And then if that doesn't convince people that you know, we have a real problem. So I am excited about partners to do medium scale. So in Kalahandi, for example, we're, I mean, we're doing validation studies at many places, but I chose Kalahandi because of an incredible NGO that works there and an incredible human being that spends all their time thinking about their community. And if we can work in the most difficult area, I, I mean, that's, that's my job is done. And then others have to kind of take on from that perspective. Uh, I think, uh, there is the validation side of the story, uh, but again, you know, funding is another big aspect of the implementation. Uh, currently, there is roughly around 200 million slides that are imaged, uh, malaria slides. But if I was to ask, give me the data, like 200 million slides for, for malaria were imaged last year, tell me what we actually know. And all we have is yes and no's, there is, you know, we are missing on a great opportunity to truly understand diseases uh, and the complexity of these diseases by bringing these types of approaches as well. So, you know, it's not just about doing better, it's about doing significantly better. And there is a cost to it. There is a training cost to it. Global health, I find it's, it's complexity on who knows who is, I mean, I'm sort of an outsider in that perspective because I didn't, I didn't go to public health. I'm into a physics school. And there is a lot of that that happens in global health, I feel. Uh, and then you just meet the right person and suddenly uh, implementation uh, support comes along. So, I mean, you know, I think uh, there is that, uh, which is, which I, I find challenging. 
have a question about your technology. How did you correlate the buzz with the species? So what we do is uh, really cool. we went to CDC and uh, several places around the world to collect first the first acoustic data sets for mosquitoes. Nobody had ever collected a very large. So we collected 40 species yeah. and it's our golden data set. And essentially we do machine learning on those sounds. Thinking, yeah. And there is a biological reasons for why mosquitoes sing the sound that you hear in your ear is actually a love song. So mosquitoes, <laughs> mosquitoes mate in flight and the female generates a frequency. The male actually has to, the male has a, a different frequency, but a harmonic, a higher harmonic of that frequency starts to match. And then the female tunes its frequency above it. And it's actually using this as an evolutionary fitness whether the male can follow up. And if that happens, that actually leads to mating. So mosquitoes have tried to differentiate their radio bands. If you think about radio, different stations want to play their music or their information at different bands. So there is an evolutionary pressure to be creating different frequencies because if in a co-localized mosquitoes, you're producing the same sets of sounds, you essentially are talking over each other. So there is a biological phenomena that we're trying to exploit. I see Stephen has a question. Yes. I would be surprised if he didn't. <laughs> uh, so, hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I apologize. I missed a good portion of your talk. I just couldn't get on. I uh, had something else that just came up and I had to deal with it. But I, uh, I, I really like the sorts of things you're talking about. I have no experience in global health and certainly in health promotion in a third world setting. But I have to confess that while I appreciate your enthusiasm for how we're gonna get out there and raise money and support for doing these things, certainly in Western society, my experience is that even if you make something free, changing behavior, executing, engaging people, getting them to adhere to whatever new evidence-based program you're offering them is extraordinarily complex. Uh, government rarely takes any leadership role in this area. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, it's really the commercial sector that has any success whatsoever, in large part because they throw huge uh, uh, dollars at it, not just uh, uh, in terms of marketing and promotion, but in terms of infrastructure support Human behavior is, there's such inertia around human behavior. I, I'm, uh, after doing this sort of thing for 35, nearly 40 years now, I'm sort of shocked at how difficult it is to really make change happen. Any, any thoughts about how you get past some of these barriers? Yeah, I think uh, a beautiful question. And there is a lot that you said in there that I agree with. Uh, I think commercialization is extremely valuable and important. Uh, and for every sets of technologies, uh, uh, we do that. Uh, but one of the important factors is in that perspective is to be thinking about the affordability context. I mean, I can take any of these technologies and they are still relevant in the Western healthcare systems as well. So, you know, this object that I described uh, it's direct competition to everything else that's currently in the market that costs 30 to $50. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, this is not, a, that's not a problem. You actually have to build uh, solutions that are broadly accessible and build pricing strategies that allow you to make something sustainable. So it's available to people at the price point that they can afford. Uh, so there is a lot of innovation that can be done in the business models themselves. And I think full scope, for example, is one framework in which, uh, of course, we have worked with governments and other places, but uh, you still actually have to buy a full scope. And it's very important that there is a perspective of uh, uh, commercialization of a class of technologies. And I think the last bit on human behavior, I think I mean, that's a really complex landscape. You all have a lot of experience for our own sets of projects. But one thing that I have to say, I, I have a sense of optimism that, you know, having done 
implementation of technologies for the last 10 years, I have met some remarkable people along the way. And these sets of individuals demonstrated capacity uh, and a vision and capabilities far beyond average human beings. And I am actually very uh, hopeful in that perspective that when you cast your net wide enough, you find partners and individuals that you then really are playing a support role in their own context and community. Uh, there is an individual that we supported in India and uh, in a rural village in India, and that one single person has trained roughly around 95,000 kids across India. He travels across India and roughly around 12,000 teachers. And to me, when I was thinking about sharing technologies, I never thought that that would be humanly possible. But uh, there are, you know, I think the, the power of human spirit uh, is an important component that we have to be thinking about. And this individual I would have never found through reading his CV or have never found through conventional means. It was a very unconventional route that I ended up bumping into this individual. Uh, and so again, you know, the question is his name is Mo. And I often wonder how many Mo's are out there? Mm -hmm. uh, how many individuals like that can we be thinking about empowering? And this is at the heart of when I, earlier on when I mentioned, we have to be collaborating, not just with the infrastructure that exists, but also with individuals that fall outside traditional infrastructures. You know, Mo, I would have never found him in a university or in a college. This is, there, there is, and so anyway, I mean, it, it's kind of, this is a moving front. I am optimistic, uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, if you really think hard about passing ownership of projects to a broader group of people, hundreds of failures will happen and then somebody will succeed. And that's okay. But, you know, well, if, you we, if we centralize about, that, it becomes very difficult. So if I can summarize your thoughts, you're basically talking about investing in change makers at the grassroots level and mm -hmm. using them as pivots or as catalysts to bring about change. So, Stephen, that's your solution. Um, we have two more questions. Can you tell if the mosquito is male or female with the app? And uh, regarding mosquitoes, don't infected mosquitoes have different sounds from uninfected mosquitoes. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> no. ticked about the mosquito thing. Yeah, I, I wish I could, uh, I remove the sound. Yeah. So first, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll let you hear the sound for a second, because I think if you all love mosquitoes, you will love this clip. And I remember uh, I might have just removed that acoustic but it's a really worthwhile thing. For the first time, you might actually appreciate the mosquito song and ah. Uh, it's on our website. If you go to abuzz.stanford.edu, you can download a ringtone uh, for your cell phone uh, that <laughs> uh, has the sound. And I think, so first of all, the question about male and female, yes, that's very straightforward to identify because uh, their frequencies are dramatically different. Uh, on the idea that can you identify a sound of a mis uh, infected versus uninfected, uh, we actually recently had a paper in which we did this for filariasis. Uh, and for the sets of diseases that impact the physiology of the mosquito, uh, we believe something like this would be possible. We are working on certain sets of viruses that dramatically impact flight muscles. So this is sort of ongoing work right now where we are starting to now record acoustics from infected mosquitoes and especially the stage of infection. So the jury is still out there. At this moment, I can't say that we've been able to do it. We've been able to do it very specifically for one kind of infection, but the role is to broadly think about this. And I think we just don't even have the data as yet. Whoa. Susan has a has a comment here. The right levers are key. Witness how for on behavior change. Witness how quickly behavior change when Bell suddenly instituted charges for calling directory assistance. I don't remember <laughs> that, but I guess that's probably. <laughs> yeah. 
So this is uh, this has been an amazing talk. We have to invite you again. I hope we continue to host these seminars and get you on a bigger platform. And I, Susan, I I want you because I have no words now. <laughs> when you're overwhelmed with emotion, you you are silent. Lovely, brilliant talk. Very inspiring. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. And uh, you know, I'm excited about engaging with uh, many of you. Of you know, I think yeah, I'm inspired by a lot of things that you guys are doing, and it would be really valuable to both continue the conversation, but also anything that I talked about, if it has relevant to uh, or ideas related to the things that you all are thinking about, please do reach out. We all do implementation science, many of us actually. <laughs> okay, so let's yeah. have a let's have a brainstorming session, and then I'll tell you also the biggest roadblocks, uh, and then we can really try working together on that. I think we'll have to invite you again for a panel discussion where we could brainstorm on implementation science, right? Angela's nodding her head. I, I would Susan. love that actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Will do. Bye everybody.